Time to Elevate. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Running on Empty, our first show of the year. I am Matt. And I'm Tony. And we are Running on Empty. And today, for our first episode of the year, and we're excited about this entire year because we have a lot of things planned. Um, do we? <laughs> no, we have a lot of things planned that are a lot of fun. And um, this this first one, um, I this is so awesome that this is our first interview of the year. Yes, it is Dr. Chris Terry. He is a former UW Oshkosh student. He went on and got his doctorate degree in media law. And he's going to have a lot of insightful things to tell us about the state of the First Amendment in our nation today. Awesome. All right. Well, I'm looking forward to it. So let's get right to it. All right. Well, I'm really honored today to be on the podcast with two of my all-time greatest students. And one, of course, is Matt King, <laughs> our co-host. And then the uh, other is uh, Dr. Chris Terry. He's an assistant professor of media law at the University of Minnesota Hubbard School of Journalism and Mass Comm. And of course, I first met Chris in the 1990s when he was a student at UW Oshkosh. He's got so much real world experience in media, got his doctorate degree at UW Madison in 2012. And uh, I learned recently, Chris, that you actually have been uh, cited in a legal brief before the United States Supreme Court. Is that right? Yes, uh, in the Prometheus Radio Project case, which is currently pending at the Supreme Court dealing with media ownership. Two of my research studies, one dealing with minority ownership policy and one a uh, policy solution argument that I made in a Federal Communications Law Journal piece were both cited uh, by the citizen petitioner side and supporters on that side in the case that's pending. Well, here at UW Oshkosh, we're always looking for points of pride. And I, you know, I would call this a point of pride that one of our alum actually has his work cited before the United States Supreme Court. Do you anticipate that uh, um, Brett Kavanaugh will like respond directly to you or? No, uh, although if Justice Gorsuch were to write the opinion, I could see him referring back to my work, Justice Kavanaugh and I don't see eye to eye and necessarily on administrative <laughs> law, but Justice, uh, well, no, Justice Gorsh uh, is a big proponent of the hour deference level rather than Chevron. Ah, and okay. uh, the arguments that I made in both of the papers that were cited in the documents in front of the court really argue that this case is sort of justifies an hour deference. Uh, and so depending on who writes that opinion, I, it's easy to see how it could be cited. Um, although he didn't name me, uh, Justice Breyer during oral arguments actually talked about the research of mine that was cited in the, uh, in the, in the case. Excellent. Well, well, speaking of, you know, wonky Supreme court law, why don't, why don't we start off with the recent impeachment trial? Um, of Donald Trump. And it, it, as you know, Chris and Matt, in that trial, it, it seemed to center on did Donald Trump incite an insurrection or at least incite violence on January 6th? And at least according to Trump's attorneys, this uh, centered on the Supreme Court case of Brandenburg versus Ohio, which I guess was 1969, correct? Correct. So maybe you can talk a little bit about that. The Brandenburg versus Ohio case, I guess, established the legal standard for incitement. So it, it, just tell us what that what that case did. And then in your judgment, did Donald Trump meet the legal definition of incitement? In, sure. The so the case is actually about a, a Ku Klux Klan leader who is charged under an Ohio state statute um, for lack of a for without going into too much detail, he uh, he was charged basically for as a terrorist for making a speech he made in a field in front of a maybe a dozen followers. And the only reason we ever knew anything about it was he actually invited a reporter from a Cincinnati television station to come out and film this Klan rally that they had. Uh, the most notable uh, part of the Klan rally uh, was that they burned a cross, not surprising, but that 
uh, Brandenburg himself coined the term revengeance mm -hmm. and suggested that he would he and his followers were about to engage in some kind of revengeance if white people weren't sort of given their due. Mm -hmm. And uh, what the court said, he was convicted in Ohio, the statute, uh, Ohio State Supreme Court upheld the conviction, goes to the U.S. Supreme Court. Brandenburg brings a traditional First Amendment defense on, on the speech. And the court solidifies a test that had kind of been uh, playing around with for a series of cases, especially the uh, communist enforcement cases in the late 50s and early 60s. And it sets up a three-part test for what constitutes legal incitement. It requires that the speaker had intent to incite illegal action, that it was likely to occur, and that it happened in a relatively rapid fashion, a, a phrase that they refer to as imminence. Imminent, yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, the legal standard that applies to a criminal conviction for incitement is actually pretty hard to meet. Um, in fact, uh, it you know, the, as you said, the test is from 1969. A lot of questions about whether or not how internet speech interacts with that test. But, but just, of course, just, to be, just to be clear, in 1969, the Supreme Court concluded that Brandenburg had not incited. Right. Because right, it was okay. not like that. He had intent that there was no imminence because nothing happened. All right. And that um, because he was just some obscure figure. And the only reason we ever knew anything about this speech was because he deliberately invited a television reporter there that sure. it was unlikely that he would uh, commit that. But they they use Brandenburg's case to establish this test. Mm -hmm. Now, there haven't been very many uh, incitement prosecutions under the Brandenburg standards, so we don't have a lot of a, a roadblock to uh, or a roadmap to follow on it. You know, of course, the, the part about the Trump impeachment is, is that an impeachment uh, standard of uh, proof is substantially different than a criminal trial. Right. But in terms of the three part test, um, I think the part that becomes really where the case would rise or fall in a criminal situation if Trump or some of the other people who were at the rally that particular morning would be in intent. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Of course, intent is always yeah. a, a hard thing to, to prove because you sort of have to be into the head of the, uh, the people. And it's certainly uh, likely that, I mean, the likelihood standard where a lot of cases actually rise and fall on in incitement, there's no question that it was likely to occur. Well, the House managers seem to be saying that uh, Trump had tried, I don't know, four or five nonviolent methods of overturning the election, right? Going into the courts, pressuring elected officials, uh, putting pressure on Mike Pence, and so on. And so they seem to be saying that he did go into January 6th with the purpose of having a violent attempt at doing this. Does that seem to be a, a compelling argument? Yeah, I actually think the more compelling case is actually against some of the other speakers, though, on that particular day, because the, oh, yeah. the rhetoric that's used in an incitement case really matters. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, some of the other speakers were more actively using action words by that is what I mean, uh, calling for uh, actual action. Uh, it's it's easy to interpret um, what Trump said as a call for action. But there were other speakers that day where there was a more direct call for action. And I actually think they're probably in more jeopardy on that than Trump himself. Would well, I would, I would take his call for action, but go back to the first debate when, when, um, when he, you know, cause he said, you know, stand, stand back and stand by. Okay. That, to <laughs> me, that was a call to action. Like, like be prepared. The problem, of course, is the imminent standard that applies. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. That the the rhetoric has to basically be grab your torch, grab your pitchfork, we're on our way. Yeah. And then people have to grab their torches, grab their pitchforks, and be on their way. And you know, so the the earlier speeches and the activities that were cited by the house managers were more towards the intent. Right. But mm -hmm. to bring an incitement charge, it has to be the rhetoric at the particular time that is imminent that leads to the likely illegal action. But Chris, if you, if, if a speaker looks into an audience and there's, you know, Confederate flags and some people have shirts on that are like advertising Holocaust denial. And there's, you know, there's a lot of people that are giving off every, every impression of being ready to fight. 
doesn't that create the imminence right there? Well, that's why I say that the intent actually becomes the hardest part to prove. Um, the other part that I think doesn't get talked a lot about is it would be very easy to pin the things that follow on the earlier speakers, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean I don't think that Trump was partially responsible. It's just that if you look at, if you do the radical anal rhetorical analysis that's required in an incitement case, um, some of those earlier speakers, Giuliani especially, oh, uh, yeah. uh, were certainly probably more, I don't want to use the word culpable, that's not correct, but you know, that, that would be easy for Trump's defense to say, look, he already spoke to a situation that was already inflamed because of Giuliani's speech and Roger Stone's speech and the other speeches that happened that morning. And that, I mean, is it a good defense? I don't know. But it is really hard to bring an incitement charge mm -hmm. uh, there. I think the House manager's uh, failure to make the case about dereliction of duty much like the previous impeachment, was a poorly targeted approach to this case. Well, Did he incite? Was a crowd incited? Clearly. Can you pin that on Trump specifically? I don't know that that, I mean, whether or not I personally think that was uh, the impetus. Uh, legally, I doubt that that's an easy case to make. Uh, it certainly is not an easy case to make, but I think it becomes even harder to defend or harder to prosecute when you can point at when their defense could point at Giuliani and the others earlier in the day as the potential source Absolutely. for that. Yeah. So, so a question. I mean, this was literally one article of impeachment. So, do you? I mean, I think that they screwed up because there should have been more things in there, like how he handled the the pandemic. You know, think things of of that nature that could be you know compounded in there. Um, do you think if those other things might have been in there that there would have been a conviction? I don't. Well, I'm somewhat skeptical that the Republicans in Congress would have uh, brought a conviction. I think that the most impeachable act of the uh, post-election phase was the phone call to Georgia, personally. Oh, yeah. I mean, that is a that, that is a clear federal crime. Yeah. And, uh, and a clear state crime as well. And, you know, we may actually see a criminal prosecution to follow on that. Right. But I, I, I mean, if I'm the House managers, I throw that one in there just because I think the shock yeah. of the attack on the Capitol led them to try to make it about this one thing when, but I mean, the same thing happened in the impeachment that happened before the pandemic is that the house managers were focused on this one phone call instead of looking at the phone call in the context of a larger pattern mm -hmm. of potentially legal behavior. And, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm not in the house. I don't know what the house managers were thinking, but it seemed to me that there was a lot more, that was really problematic about what happened after the election than just what happened on January 6th, as what shocking you, as what, that was itself. So. Chris, what did you make of the fact that some of the Republicans, especially Mitch McConnell, Ugh. they they vote to acquit, but then after the trial is over, they give these stinging messages, these speeches, blaming Trump for everything. Is that just like trying to have your cake and eat it too? Well, that was actually the metaphor I was going to use. Um, <laughs> the uh, no, I, seriously, um, I, uh, I, I mean, I don't, I, I would hate to be in the head of Mitch McConnell. I would shut up <laughs> what that might look like in many ways. But um, I mean, I, I, you know, whatever Mitch McConnell's deficiencies are, he does have some respect for our institutions, right? Mm -hmm. I sort of disagree um. with his approach. <laughs> yeah, some. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure he's really uncomfortable with what happened that day, right? I mean but is not willing to necessarily take a specific stand. You know, you, you'll never go wrong betting against Mitch McConnell's uh, ability to find ways to weasel out of various things. The Senate should have taken up the impeachment before the inauguration. Oh, right? yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. There's, no, there's no question about that. And, you know, his decision to punt it into the next Congress and everything else that gave him the cover he needed. And, his, you know, his argument is, of course, well, he's not president anymore. We shouldn't impeach. Well, if you know anything about the how impeachment works, that's not even close to true. Right. So they used that as cover. But I think there were probably 10 or 15 people in the Republican Congress uh, caucus in the Senate who were very uncomfortable about what happened. Our current senator, notwithstanding. Um, the uh, Wisconsin senator, I mean, yeah, the Ron uh, Johnson. yeah, uh, 
I mean, I think there were probably more votes to do something about it. But had this happened in, say, the midterms, I think you might have seen a little more action uh, on it. You know, the yeah. fact that a lot of them consider him Trump being him sort of old news. Um, I think one thing that doesn't get talked enough about in terms of the historical value of this, if there is such a thing, is that we still haven't heard rhyme or reason of Mike Pence. Yep. Right. And Mike, I mean, what whatever Democratic legislators were in potential imminent danger, it's very clear that at least some of the people who penetrated the Capitol were looking for Pence. Yeah. And it would have been interesting to get his point of view. I mean, he was an established senator. He's been in one form of government in the United States for, you know, or another for a long time and certainly was the more stately of the the people in those previous administrations. So yeah. the fact that he didn't come in one way or the other, right, is uh, I think will be one of the things that drives historians quite crazy for some time. Man, exactly. if I was Mike Pence, I'd have been, <laughs> I would not have been quiet about this. And especially when, when there's a flipping gallows outside that when their people are chanting, hang Mike Pence. Um, yeah, we're not friends anymore. <laughs> it's yeah, just no, it's, God. But I mean, you know, 50 years from now, historians will look back on this and they'll wonder, where was he? Why, why did he not have an opinion here? Well, yeah. you know, for 40 years, the Republicans kept the far right fringe, like on the fringe. And then with Trump, they invited them in explicitly. And now they're all afraid to offend this, this so-called base, right? And so my guess is Trump is thinking, uh, I'm sorry, Pence is thinking of 2024. He's giving it some time because he, in his mind, he probably thinks he needs some of these nuts, right? It's, oh. it's, it's really sad what's happened over there. I don't, uh, I, I try not to uh, put calculus on people who I've never interacted with. Yeah. Um, but I can tell you people I worked with in talk radio back in the day are fully on board with this. And I used to think some of them were actually fairly reasonable folks. Wow. Uh, but they are they've taken the full on dive and I can't tell if it's just that's reflective of the audience that they're trying to communicate and attract or if they're actually in that. But some people I actually used to have a lot of respect for They're they have gone in feet first as from as high a mountain as they could jump off of. Well, you know, this, this, this three pronged communication strategy of calling everything you disagree with fake news, every accusation gets responded to with a what about ism. And then the constant yeah. trolling, you know, I think that became an addictive communication style, right? And I, well, I well of course it did because it's a pandemic too. I mean, that's the yeah. only style we really had at that point. But go ahead, I'm sorry. Well, but yeah. all of those mechanisms are leftovers yeah. from talk radio. Yeah, exactly. Right? I mean, they yeah. just they have they've graduated to other media forms. But the, none of those things are even remotely new in conservative communicative spheres. I mean, right. We, but they seem now to have become the dominant mode of communication. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, I don't do enough rhetorical analysis to, to have a theory on that. But, but I mean, you get a guy like Bill Cassidy, right? This is the conservative Republican senator from Louisiana, right? He has nothing personally to gain from voting to convict Trump, but he did vote to convict Trump. And the Louisiana Republican Party passes a resolution censuring him. Same thing with, I think, all the other Republicans that voted to convict. Right. I mean, how do you censure a guy for upholding his oath of office? The people who should be censured are the people who, before the trial even started, said, my mind is made up. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's censurable. Yeah. Arguably, though, if you, you want to play the fair and balanced game, Russ Feingold led 32 senators during the Clinton impeachment and said that they would never vote for conviction um, before the trial in the Senate. No, it's and true. Um, I mean, so, I mean, it's not just a conservative thing, right? And I mean, Russ Feingold, one of the most rational senators the U.S. has seen yeah. in a long time uh, before and since. So, you know, I, I mean, I, I, I don't like yeah, you're point. right. I don't like to point uh, aspersions at it just being conservatives that are sort of drinking the Kool-Aid these days, but uh, I mean, we've certainly, the only, the we only defense, certainly been the flavor that's been available most right. recently. The, the only defense I guess you could make of the Democrats in the 90s was that what Clinton was accused of 
doesn't seem to be close to the facts of this case. But I, but I, st- I agree with the main point, though. If you take an oath to, you know, be judicious and listen to the facts, you should do that. Yeah. Don't yeah. announce in advance what your yeah. decision is. Absolutely. Now, Chris, uh, Donald Trump, before he left office, um, he, you know, he was obviously at war with many things. But one thing he was at war with was Section 230 of the Telecommunications Act of 1996. Now, can you tell us what is Section 230 of the Telecommunications sure. Act of 1996? It's uh, it's actually not Section 230 of the Telecommunications Act. It's actually Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. Exactly. Which is actually part of the Telecommunications right. Act. That's a, <clears throat> that's a story for another time. Right. <laughs> what Section 230 is, is it's 26 words. That's all it is, 26 words long. And what it functionally does is it protects websites, web providers, web platforms, depending on who you're talking about, but any website that hosts third-party content from being sued for that third-party content. So functionally, what that means is, Tony, I don't like you anymore. I say some bad things about you on Facebook. Uh, Some of those are potentially libelous and you decide that the best thing to do would be to sue me for that. You're only going to recover so much damage in that. But hey, if you went after Facebook for that, Facebook's got some pretty deep pockets, right? Mm -hmm. And so what 230 does is it prevents you from going after Facebook for things like defamation. Now, 230 came out of a pair of cases that were decided while the Telecommunications Act was being debated. The first was a a case involving CompuServe Mm -hmm. and a second case involving Prodigy, both of which were old style AOL era web platforms or internet service providers. Um, And in one case, the Covey case, the CompuServe case, because CompuServe didn't do any of its own content moderation, um, the court declared that Con, uh, CompuServe wasn't liable for third-party content. But Prodigy, and this goes back a ways, Prodigy was marketing itself as more of a family-friendly internet platform than AOL or CompuServe at the time. And Prodigy did have a fairly active and aggressive content moderation scheme. The content that was uh, defamatory that appeared on Prodigy wasn't produced by uh by Prodigy itself, it was a third party content. Mm -hmm. But in that case, the court said, well, Prodigy is more like a publisher than sort of a distributor. And as such, they are liable for the content. So while the Telecommunications Act was being debated, um, people saw this and recognized that this would definitely, the fear that third party content would make the people hosting it liable um, it definitely uh, convinced some people in Congress, uh, notably uh, Ron Wyden, who mm-hmm. that we needed to have some sort of protection built into that. And they slide that protection into the Communications Decency Act, which is being pushed very hard by some very conservative senators who want to regulate uh, porn on the Internet uh, right. and in decent content, much in the way we do for broadcasters. Um, and sort of a devil's bargain is made to get the uh, Section 230 added to the Communications Decency Act. Communications Decency Act is then tested in court in Reno v. ACLU. Court overturns almost all of the Communications Decency Act because it's radically overbroad and would have definitely infringed upon right. even protected forms of speech online. But they left Section 230 in place because they saw it as a speech producing mechanism. So as a practical matter, if Section 230 was repealed, would that mean that Facebook would have to start acting like the New York Times? Yes, very, very <laughs> clearly. Um, now, correctly, um, it would be very problematic for Facebook to continue to post content, host it the way that they have in the past. But big entities like Facebook, Google, et al., mm-hmm. they have experience in places where they don't have First Amendment protection. So they have better content moderation schemes in other places than they uh-huh. use domestically. Mm-hmm. The problem, of course, is the little guy. The little guy doesn't have the resources or the mechanisms or the legal team that Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, Snapchat Mm -hmm. at all have. Um, And of course, those are the people who are going to suffer. 
Now, we've only had two really, well, one really significant penetration of 230's blanket immunity on mm -hmm. this. And that was the FOSTA bill, which was signed into law by President Trump, but it had been kind of pending for a while in 2018. What happened with FOSTA was FOSTA was designed to eliminate this liability protection for websites like Backpage that hosted ads for prostitution, but also were areas where sex trafficking was occurred. Yeah. Except what happened was that Backpage got shut down by the government without FOSTA. And then as soon as FOSTA went into effect, tons of websites that had information on there that was designed to help people who were being self trafficked mm. resources, places that they could get away, money, but were could be seen as facilitating sex trafficking or prostitution. They had to pull their websites. And it should give us pause as we talk about repealing or modifying 230 that the lesson of FOSTA was if you don't do this right, you're going to kill an awful lot of really important speech online. So do you support keeping 230 in place the way it is? Well, for a long time, I was in the let's fix it. It's it's it doesn't work the way it was intended, mostly because it's 25 years old as of a couple of weeks ago. Hmm. But FOSTA sort of radicalized me in many ways on this and that I'm much more skeptical of reform proposals of it. In many ways, though, 230 works a lot like the First Amendment. Um, yeah, it protects some awful speech, but the fact that it protects the awful speech means it protects a lot of really important speech, too. Right. Now, it, I'm not unsympathetic to it protects a lot of really awful speech online, but it is literally the cornerstone on which the Internet developed. The Internet, as everyone understands it today, especially in the United States, is based on the fact that 230 liability goes. You can't pull at a cornerstone of any any media structure like that without significant consequences. And I don't right. think that people who are in the reform and repeal movement believe in that so much. They sort of see 230 as this magic bullet, but much of the speech that they object to that 230 protects would be protected by the First Amendment anyway. And so what, okay, go ahead. I, I think that, you know, while I'm not, I don't object to a reform proposal in theory, I have yet to see one that will actually improve the situation and withstand judicial scrutiny. All right. So let me ask you this then. Facebook and Twitter and other of the big platforms over the last few years have been much more aggressive in being content moderators. For example, Twitter has banned Donald Trump. I think Facebook Forever. has banned him, right? <laughs> I think Facebook has banned him too, right? They've, yes. they've banned Alex Jones, right? Uh, and so on. By them taking that kind of aggressive role, are they not hastening the end of 230? Well, that's a, it's an argument that comes about, but of course their activity to decide that any particular person, whether they're somebody in that category or somebody on the far left just as easily, mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's protected activity under the first amendment. So even if 230 were to go away, none of those actions were, would change. Okay. It would be to some benefit, although debatable how much, but some benefit to a larger platform to make 230 go away because it will make it harder for startups and new entrants to compete with oh. them because they won't have that level of protection or the resources that Facebook, sure. Google, and the others would have. So 230, while yeah, it provides some some protections to some pretty bad people. And, you know, I expect Mark Zuckerberg to turn into some sort of James Bond villain here in the next five years or something <laughs> of that nature. I mean, um, isn't he just like that archetype for like a James Bond? Yeah. Like, well, yeah, he just I mean, said he, he wanted, he wants to inflict pain on Apple. Yeah, so that's okay. what a, that's what a megalomaniac would say, I think. So, <laughs> so while it, yeah, while it protects those platforms and, you know, we can have a separate debate about whether or not how those platforms are acting as good or bad. It also protects all kinds of other speech and all kinds of other people who don't have those resources. And so then, I mean, do you think that Facebook and Twitter and other big platforms have made a mistake by, say, banning tr uh, Trump and other speech? I mean, have they have they now made it inevitable, as you kind of suggested, that now voices on the left will more easily be censored? Well, I mean, it's it's the old house party analogy from way back when, right? I mean, we're all from Wisconsin. We're all Oshkosh associated. Let's <laughs> let's use a metaphor that we can understand. 
you can come to my house party and you can be a jerk and I can let you stay for as long as you want. It's my house, right? Yeah. Other other guests are offended. Hey, he's my buddy. I can let him stay as long as I want. But I can also ask you to leave at any time. It's my house, right? Yeah. And the problem with getting involved in that process, of course, is it involves state action, right? If you say to Facebook, they have to keep X, Y, and Z and A, B, and C on the other side, yeah. that's, that is a clear compelled speech situation. Yeah. And that's when the first amendment gets involved. So if you get rid of 230 and do that at the same time, you, you might actually make the situation far worse than it is now because right. you're going to remove the protection from, you know, people who don't have the resources to protect themselves. And you're going to give the people who have the resources to protect themselves a reason to go to court. And this court, the current Supreme court would buy that compelled speech argument in one second flat. I mean, Chris, do you think do you think the First Amendment is passe in the 21st century? I mean, when they when they wrote it in the 1780s, they were talking about pamphlets and newspapers and platform speeches. They clearly were not imagining this global digital madness we have now. Is it is it you know you talked about possibly reforming Section 230? Is it is it time to reform the entire First Amendment? Well, I'd say. Uh... A theoretical versus practical thing. <laughs> I think that the, the First Amendment's theory is still relatively sound. Where we've gotten off on the practice is that we have sort of made it First Amendment uber alles. And a lot of speech that wouldn't have traditionally gotten First Amendment protections, things like Citizens United decision, for example, where we extended First Amendment rights to non-citizen entities, that's where we've gone you know, arguably wrong in some of the changes that we've made. It's not the First Amendment that's the problem. It's how we've interpreted the First Amendment and what we've applied it to that has arguably sort of changed the metric on the First Amendment. And it's still very sound. It protects us from government action against speech. And it's a near absolute protection, uh, you know, outside of a category of commercial or unprotected speech. That's a that's not a bad thing. And you, you be careful that it's one of those you, you better be Better be sure how you're going to do this if you're going to going to play with, with fire there. But and I think I think there there needs to be uh, accountability too to to some of this stuff. If you're going to be able to say it, it's like going into a movie theater and yelling fire when there's no fire. If somebody's hurt, you did something wrong, even though you you could have easily said fire, right? So so where does where I mean where does the accountability? Because well, like the last four years, there hasn't been a whole lot of accountability as far as I can see. Well, I would argue that that's not true in that many people who say things are held to a much higher standard to the things that they say now, which is accountability. True. I mean, because we have, we're part of cancel culture. And so right. you say one thing and boom, you're gone. You know, I, the 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 falsely shouting fire metaphor from Shank needs to be eliminated from U.S. history. I think people misapply that. Uh, most times they forget that it's falsely shouting fire that's prohibited in a, in a yeah. crowded theater but also that it really isn't indicative of what we're talking about. You are still entirely and always have been entirely responsible for what you say. It's just that the, it's not the government who's allowed to punish you for it, except in rare circumstances where the speech doesn't get full protection. Right. And that's a good thing, right? It doesn't mean you're not accountable for the things that you say. You just, you, the government doesn't get to be the, per, the entity that makes you accountable. Right. And if you object to that, then you have to role play it out regardless of where you are in the political spectrum, conservative, liberal, somewhere, you know, purple spaghetti monster, whatever, <laughs> you, you, you need to consider what the exact opposite of that is. And would you want that, that entity to have the power to tell you that that speech is so bad that it needs to be regulated and you can be punished for it. And boy, that it doesn't take long to figure out that that's a terrible idea. Chris, does that mean uh, there's no accountability for speech? No, you are. I, right. I'm a very public figure on some very hot button issues. And I recognize every time I open my mouth publicly, I'm accountable for the things that I say. Right. Chris, we're, we're just about out of time. Just one, one last thing. What can we expect from the Federal Communication Commission under Joe Biden? Well, uh, right now we have Jessica Rosenworcel as the interim chair, and we won't have a clear view on what to expect uh, until we have a full commission. We don't have a nomination or even a name that's being strongly bantered about for the for the fifth commissioner. Uh, Rosenworcel is a big proponent of solving digital divide issues, so I would expect broadband development and deployment to be high on the list. 
and very clear um, that the Biden administration is going to push for some form of net neutrality uh, because they dropped the case uh, that was pending against the state of California on California's state net neutrality provisions. Um, and there's only one reason to have done that. Whether they bring it back as full Title II as they did in 2015 before the Trump administration, I, I can't say yet. Uh, my suspicion is, is that, that the, a new net neutrality plan, if and when we get one, will look suspiciously like the 2015 plan did. Right. Okay. And we should do another show with you, Chris, just to dig into net neutrality, because that's another one that could take an entire show or should oh, take that'd be an a lot of fun. Show. A lot of fun. Yeah. Anytime. I love yeah. to see you guys. Thanks so much for being here, Chris. We appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks, Chris. All right. Anytime. Tony, I really enjoyed that interview, man. For our first interview of the year, um, I, th I think we're off to a really good start. Yeah, I, I agree. Chris is a super, super smart guy, and he's literally a nationally known expert on First Amendment issues. And that I'm, is awesome. I, yeah, I'm really proud that you guys were in my classes, you know, and it's just such a thrill for me to be in this kind of conversation. So, and I'm sure we'll have him back. Well, I, I really want to have him back, man, because there's definitely more I want to talk about. Absolutely. And there's a lot that's going to be there. So until next time, let's uh, hope everyone stays elevated. Running on empty with Matt and Tony.